Let's face it, parenting is the most important job on earth. Every day presents a stack of different challenges, and more often than not, the answer is outside of the box. On this podcast, we will offer proven strategies, interview pioneers in education, give insights into how to be successful parents, and even share our imperfect experiences of being parents ourselves. We're all in on this journey, and we will span the globe to find out what is working and who has the answers. This is the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast. Here are your hosts, Darren McCarthy and Brian Powers. Welcome to the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast. I'm Brian Powers. And I'm Darren McCarthy. Darren, today we are talking about some sleep, sleep skills with Dr. Robin Kozlowitz from Targeted Parenting. Yes, sir. Fantastic. We've always wanted to get somebody that was specializing a little bit more in sleep because, well, without that, um, where are we, right? It's one of those essential non-negotiables. True foundation. Um, Yes, yeah, she, she she was Dr. Robin goes into a, a lot of things, but ultimately we wanted to kind of just hone in on, on on the specifically about sleep. So there's some gems all over the place. But I picked up one of the things that we talked about was uh, something she calls parental self doubt syndrome, and I know this is definitely something that actually keeps me awake at night from from getting my own sleep, which causes a whole sense you know sense of anxiety and everything else. It's like how do we know what we're doing right as a parent? And I like that it has a name now so we can, we can call it something. What do you think of that one? Yeah, no, I mean, she gave us a ton of resources. I really like the fact that she talked about more about training the parent before, uh, before the child even comes into therapy with her. Um, and then often that, that limits the amount of therapy that's needed because she's training the parent on what to do and how to, how to deal with things outside of the therapy session. Yeah, and 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 that whole the, the whole concept of wanting to know as a parent, or as 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 a practitioner as well, it's about why. So you know, always kind of digging deeper to try to understand. Well, why are we where we are, and how do yeah. we get where we need to go? So asking those questions, and I think the one thing that really stood out to me on on top of all this was, you may not have the recipe as a parent, but there are people that do. Yeah, there are people that specialize in certain things like, you know, so we're scan we're spanning the globe trying to find somebody that has kind of a background in sleep because we know that's a, an essential piece. And there's somebody there. She just happens to be in New Jersey, which is not too far from us, which is um, convenient. But modern technology is really teaching us that everybody's in, in everybody's convenient. backyard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, so that, I thought that was it. Those two pieces really kind of stood out for me, and there's just so much more, obviously. Yeah. Anything else for you on the on no, the? No, I mean, I, I think this was just a great episode, and and like we say, with all all the ones we do, they're they're like this, not going to be the last. Uh, I think uh, you know she's going to bring, she just brings a lot of uh, good topics to the table. Absolutely. Um, she, you know, the, the, there was another piece here. She was talking about. Um, the we think as a parent if they didn't have a good night sleep last night we probably didn't we didn't start early enough or we didn't get the routine down enough or you know kind of that the whole thing that self doubt it's like what did i do wrong where they didn't sleep well and what she really highlighted for me that i wasn't thinking about at all was that it's not just the routine before sleep it's actually the way the day starts the routine yeah ultimately and, routine you know and getting yeah getting them at, getting them ready for sleep by waking them up in the proper manner like you know you know those days where we just grab your shoes grab your hat go catch the bus you know yeah and that that whole kind of charging the system before it's kind of ready affects their entire day and then later on that kind of spirals them out after school and then they get wound up and then they don't go to sleep at a, in, a, in a nice way so it, there really is a recipe and she lays it out and I think I think people should you know I know I, I, I listened back a couple times and I'm starting to to really uh, kind of put these put these plans in action but yeah. it, you know it takes takes work and you got to kind of forgive yourself when you slip what did she say don't you, it's okay to slip but don't slide <laughs> yeah yes yeah no hey <laughs> Hey, I agree, and I think uh, that kind of gives a good intro into getting people to download the companion uh, to this episode. Make sure they, you know, sign up with our with their email address, uh, and so they can 
that get the companion to this episode and really then access to all of our episodes uh, by you know visiting the site soundfoundationsforparenting.net. Absolutely. So without further ado, Dr. Robin Kozlowitz. Welcome, Dr. Robin. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to you know, just hear a little bit more about you and, and what you're doing to help parents. Sure. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm Dr. Robin Koslowitz. I am the clinical director, the educational director of the Targeted Parenting Institute. What we do at Targeted Parenting is we train parents to understand their kids' unique neuro profiles, to understand their personality, to understand their um, emotions, to understand how their brains work. A lot of parents... When they think about their parenting, they think about parenting, so to speak, the neurotypical child, whether that's how they were parented, or even what they see, if you watch like any TV show, you read any book, you kind of hear about like good parenting practices that work for the average neurotypical child. But as soon as you have a child who is a little bit out of the norm, a child whose brain is grappling with a challenge that other kids' brains don't have, all of a sudden we need some very specialized skills. So targeted parenting was born out of me spending a lot of time in psychotherapy explaining the same information to parent after parent after parent, you know, one-on-one and thinking, wait a minute, why don't I get all these people into a group, teach them all this information so they get it. And then when we're in therapy, the parents understand so much more. And what I found when I did that was a lot of parents never needed therapy after that. Like that was enough. Just learning their kid's brain, learning effective parenting, learning how to effectively parent an anxious child, which is very different than effectively parenting an impulsive child. That was enough. And we never actually needed to go to the, to the actual psychotherapy. And with some kids, we did need to go into psychotherapy, but then psychotherapy was shorter because me and the parent were on the same page. The parent sort of had a mini child psychologist in their back pocket that they could pull out and they would understand. And then we would just work on the specific things we needed to work on with the kid. So that's really where targeted parenting comes in. And, you know, my passion for educating parents. Recently, I started a new class on post-traumatic parenting because I discovered that a lot of parents have a lot of self-doubt about parenting because of things they went through in their own childhood, whether their parents were divorced or whether they lost a parent or even they were bullied as a kid or they were very shy as a kid. And they feel like, I didn't have a regular childhood. How am I going to give my children a regular childhood? So I started post-traumatic parenting as a course for those parents. Initially, it was only for parents who had lost a parent in childhood, but then it expanded to anyone who had some sort of a trauma in childhood, and now they're doubting their own instincts as a parent. And it's been like surprisingly extremely popular. You'd be surprised at the people who seem to have it all together. And they have this like what looks like a great family life and a great, you know, great kids, great everything, great job. And then they have this parental self-doubt syndrome because of what they went through. Like, do I, how do I know what's normal? How do I know if it's a thing or not? Right. With my kids. Sure. So that's been like an extremely rewarding class to teach and to share with people. I have so that's to have pretty cool because- here. This is exact same words I used with my wife last night. I, we were doing something very simple. You know, she was using a water pick for teeth, teeth brushing, you know. Mm-hmm. I said, how do you know how to do this stuff? <laughs> you know, like, like, so, and, there's, and there's this a whole series of things that just come so, like, it's almost like innate to her. I grew up with a single mom. Dad left when I was three. And this exact thing that you're talking about kind of happens almost on a regular basis. And, and it seems to me like there are the times that I feel most successful are the times that I'm not really listening to that dial, inner, inner dialogue, I guess, as right. Dr. Dr. Phil said. That voice, right. Um, how do you explain this, this really heady stuff to, to parents so that they understand it and can walk away with it and kind of tap back into it? So I think, first of all, it's demystifying it, right, with parents understanding that it's okay, that parental self-doubt syndrome is very normal, and that when you've had an atypical childhood, it's even more normal, and, and that it's totally fine. And the first thing you have to do is accept that, yes, there were things about my childhood that I really wish wouldn't have happened. And I really wish I could go back into the past and like redo my childhood, you know, in a much more typical fashion or in a much more healthy fashion. But I didn't have that, but I can learn, right? And whatever it was that I didn't have from my parents, I can still provide to my children as long as I'm mindful about wanting to provide that to my children and understanding that there's a recipe, right? There's a way I always say to parents when they start, sometimes um, parents are, you know, suggested to come to a parenting class by their school. I work, I consult in a lot of schools and sometimes they're a little offended. Like, 
I have to take a parenting class? Like what, like what? And I always say to the school, you know, it's kind of like this idea, like if I go to like, uh, I don't know, a potluck and someone bakes a really good cake and I go in and I taste her cake and I start like teasing it apart and pulling apart the crumbs and thinking like, did she put in nutmeg? Is that cocoa powder? And like, I can sit there and I can do that. And I might even figure it out. Or I can like call the lady with the recipe and be like, hey, you made a great cake. How'd you do that? Right? And that's kind of like a parenting class. Like there are recipes for these things. Like there are ways to like get better from anxiety. There are ways to get better from impulse control problems. Like just call the lady with the recipe. So if, when we have a kid who's ha going through something and we ourselves weren't parented well about that issue, right? So just today I was talking to um, a mom who has very poor executive functioning. She never was taught to be organized and her daughter's having the same problem. She's feeling very threatened when the school said that her daughter needs help with executive functioning. And I use this analogy. So call the lady with the recipe. You're saying that you don't have good executive functioning. You feel a lot of shame about it. And now when the school called you, you were feeling all the shame of like, I'm such a mess and my house is so disorganized. I'm like, oh my goodness. And like, I'm a bad mother. Let's tap into that feeling and not give that to your daughter. So the school is saying they have an executive functioning specialist who can teach your daughter organizational skills. Wow, yay. Instead of looking at it as a shameful, I don't know how to teach this to my daughter, maybe let's teach her. And maybe, you know, there's people who teach grown-ups executive functioning skills too. Maybe, you know, you can learn those lessons alongside your daughter. Let's take the shame out of it. Nobody taught you. It's not your fault, but it is your problem, right? It's not your fault. You're right. You were raised by a mom who never taught you executive functioning. Your mom was disorganized for whatever reason that was going on. She did the best she could with the tools she had. She didn't have great tools about this. So you don't have those tools. So let's give them to you. There's no shame. Like, I don't feel ashamed that I don't know how to, you know, get a, I don't know, a basketball into a basket. I am sure if somebody coached me and taught me, I could learn the skill. I, I don't value it enough to try, but if I wanted to, I bet I could learn, right? It's not shameful. It's just a skill I don't have. No, but we tend to get locked up as adults in that, you know, especially in our careers is that, you know, we need to be, we can't, once we hit, you know, that point in our career, we need to constantly be the, the expert on it and not continue to be a learner. Um, sure. and, and that lifelong learner aspect, you know, trait is something that, that needs to be there. Um, or again, like you just said, you get locked up, you know, by your past, uh, and, and can't move forward. Although I feel like my entire expertise with kids is, is getting curious and asking why, right? That's like, like I, I had this actually today in, in a school, a, a I wasn't supposed to be doing this. I was there to observe a different student. She was absent and a kid was in the hallway and was being disruptive. And the principal said, like, you know what? You're here anyway. We have permission from our parents. Can you talk to her? And in two minutes, she and I were having a whole conversation about what's been going on in her classroom. And the principal was like, how'd you do that? And all I did was, she said, I can't be in my classroom today. And I said, okay, why? That, that's, I mean, like, that's my entire expertise is being curious, <laughs> right? My entire expertise is asking questions. It took me a long time to learn that. I remember as a graduate student not knowing how to do things and feeling like very, like, like pressure to, like, hide the fact that I didn't know. And, like, I remember, like, opening up, like, you know, different, like, statistics six programs for dummies so that I could learn it so that like someone would give me a job and they'd be like, okay, I need you to run these analyses for me by tomorrow. And I was like, I don't know how to run these analyses. And I didn't know how to ask. So I would just like buy like, I don't know, Minova for dummies and like <laughs> teach it to in six hours. And like, and then like after a while I learned like, wait a minute, just I'd be like, you know, I actually never ran this computer program. Can someone teach me how? Like, and then, well, oh, the you think of it. Is, is because there's so much information out there that we feel like, um, we can we know enough to, to be dangerous as they say, but when you talk about right. parental self doubt, for example, that's a tar that's a trigger to um, to keep us awake at night, right? It's one of those things yeah. that just kind of keeps keeps our mind spiraling. And I think one of the things that I've been personally working on everything's personal, right? For parents, right, for sure. <laughs> so like like sleeping, right? So you start to read about sleep and and how to how to do a better job of it. You're, you're kind of running around looking for the sleep guru. I go back to like Dr. Wayne Dyer. You know, he, he used to talk right. about if your mind is, if you're, you're either past thinking, you know, which is more uh, guilt oriented, future thinking, which is more worry oriented or present minded. And so everything right. talks about being present minded and, um, and then, and sleep is, is caught, is that kind of piece that gets caught in the middle of all that thought. And is it, is it true that the, the child kind of latches on to our own 
sense of uh, parental self-doubt and those same triggers keep them awake as well? Definitely. Um, I think that also we have to remember with sleep, um, sleep is one of those things. I call it a feeder decision when we make decisions about prioritizing sleep because if we have enough sleep, we have the foundation for like literally everything else. Self-regulation gets a lot better. Um, our ability to like stay in that more cold state where we're not, our emotions are not activated and we can think things through our willpower. I mean, everything ultimately, all that stuff depends on how much sleep we get. Um, we as parents, so there's two things with parental self-doubt. First of all, we as parents have to know that there are certain unshakable principles, right? The one big, there's, there's like a quote that like the one true answer in parenting is it depends, right? And that's usually true with most questions that parents have. It depends on a lot of things. But there are some like basics, right, about care and feeding of children and of care and feeding of adults and basically care and feeding of humans. And one of them is we need sleep. We are biological creatures. We need sleep. We need food. We need, we need water, right? Like those are immutable principles, right? If we don't have the bottom two tiers and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we can't push through. If we don't feel safe, we don't feel secure, right? That second tier of Maslow's hierarchy. And if we don't have sleep, food, hydration, right? Warmth, right? All of those kinds of things, then those are the immutable principles, right? Those are not, it depends. You always need your sleep, right? You always need to be eating. You always need to be drinking. Like those are things that like we can't do without, right? We can talk about what to do if in an emergency situation they don't happen, but those are the hard and fast rules. Um, sleep nowadays is a serious problem. And there's actually a lot of research now about like every so often a research paper will pop into like one of the journals that I'm following about is ADHD really a sleep disorder? Is autism really a sleep disorder? Right? Is are certain phobias really sleep disorders? Right? Because there is a very strong connection between sleep and our brain's ability to press the reset button on a lot of the things that we look at, like, okay, we're going to fix the ADHD, and we don't look at those feeder decisions that make it worse, right? We don't look at those, at those things. Um, sleep in particular is one of them. And for us as parents, sometimes we have a hard time sleeping because of our own anxiety, and we can talk about that in a minute. And then one of those things that our kids sometimes actively resist that we know that we have to feel very strongly about and we have to communicate to our kids this is an essential it's a non-negotiable sleep's going to happen right like smartphones smartphones are not going in our bedrooms no matter what like there are certain things that are going to be like i don't care what just like like no you can't drink that gigantic bottle labeled drain cleaner right no it's a hard and fast no we're very comfortable saying that right yes you are going to take your medication right you're going to take your antibiotics exactly as the doctor ordered like we're not playing a game with that in the same way we're not going to play a game with sleep. It's not a negotiation. It's not like, well, I think that video game's a little on the violent side, but your dad disagrees and like, mm, we'll have, you know, I'll, I'll be fuzzy about it, right? This is like, no, sleep's happening. Like, this is, this is a non-negotiable. So if you're talking about like those fast rules for parenting, that's one of them. Like sleep it's has not, to happen. It's not a trend. Like, you know, so, so like you said, hydrating. You know, where right. there was this whole thing of how much, you know, carrying your water bottle around and, and drinking a certain amount. It feels like everything's kind of tied to if there's a marketing strategy, then it becomes something that's like some kind of trend. And, and sleep, like you said, is a foundational need. So how do we get our grips around? Um, I know there's charts out there about like how many hours kids need based on their ages and so on and so forth. Um, is that something that you recommend um, if you're if you're if that's a struggle for the family that you recommend observing and, and tracking? Definitely. I'm into data. So I like tracking things. So I, uh, I'm, I'm very into like tracking our sleep, noticing that when we sleep more, we have better days and things like that. But even more so, I think we have to track what we do in the evening that sets us up for sleep. And that is like sleep, you know, like sort of like sets us up, sets our brains up to not be able to fall asleep. Right. Because I feel like we get a lot more information about that. Like if supper is a little later, if practice runs over time, if we're stressed out, if we don't give the kids enough like winding down time, like, oh, wow, that really has an effect on our sleep. Wow, I never noticed that. You know, um, so that you can sort of like say, oh, that's the origin of that problem. Okay, so we have to think of another way of handling it because clearly we're not winding down fast enough. 
um, to get that good night's sleep, right? We're not, we're not getting our greens ready. I think parents have to understand that greens have to be primed for sleep. And priming a brain for sleep starts almost like the morning before. Like if I want to prime my kid's brain to fall asleep at their bedtime or like very close to their bedtime that night, then how am I structuring the morning to set it up so that it happens? It's, it, there's a lot. See, the thing is some people naturally are very rhythmic and they have great circadian rhythms and they can fall asleep easily. And when they're tired, they sleep and it's natural for them. And those people, it's great. But some people are just the opposite. Some kids have very hungry brains and their brains are actively resisting being shut down, right? And there's a lot of reasons what, what the brain is hungry for we can talk about. But when you have that kind of brain, we have to plan for tonight's sleep early, early today's morning, right? Like otherwise sleep that night is not going to happen. We have to structure the day for sleep. And if we structure the day for sleep and we target sleep strongly, then all the other things that we're targeting become that much easier. Like, like I said, that's the feeder decision that, that makes all the other decisions much more possible. Can you walk us through, um, cause you know, sleeping in our house is a, is a roller coaster ride as probably with anybody's. Um, but can you kind of walk us through or give us a few like takeaways on what we could implement with that? It's, you know, I know there's a, a lot around the whole screen time and you know, when to start to shut that off and, you know, the, there's even glasses that, you know, people wear that reduce their, their screen time uh, effects. Talk, can you talk a little bit to like, you know, just some tips? Sure. So I start in the morning. It's, this is going to sound very like counterintuitive, but getting up a little earlier, mm -hmm. opening up the shades in the room so that the room is as flooded with sunlight as possible. And if you live in a place where that's not possible certain times of year, there are those um, sunlight alarm clocks that actually mimic the sun. Um, and they've actually done, you can, I, I've shown this to kids. There's actually a, a video on YouTube where they, they convinced the rooster it was the morning in the middle of the night and the rooster started to crow, <laughs> which means it really is mimicking the sun, right? Sure. Like it, it worked. Um, so the idea is, what those, what those alarm clocks do is they brighten gradually, just like the sun would. So if you have a room, like one of my kids, the room just doesn't get a lot of sunlight in the morning, even though you know we live in a house where most of the rooms do, but that room doesn't. Um, so we use that alarm clock just so that by the time their brain wakes up, it's waking up to light and it's resetting the circadian rhythm that this is the light is coming in, it's the morning time, it's alertness time, it's time for like that dopamine to start being released, it's time for us to start, it's time for us to start our morning routine. I'm very into, into scents and pairing the day, not because I'm into aromatherapy, because I'm not, but because our brains are creatures of habit and our brains are very easily trained into things. Um, just like I have this thing where like when I go to a neighborhood that I grew up in, when I, when I, when I travel back, I grew up in Brooklyn. When I travel back to Brooklyn, I drive down a certain street. I get hungry for black and white cookies because there was a, <laughs> I don't even like cookies anymore, but there was a bakery on that block that had the best black and white cookies. My father used to buy them for me all the time. So like I drive down that street, I want a black and white cookie, right? We can train our brains. We can, we can, our brains are such creatures of habit, right? Basically what our brains do is they notice patterns, right? So, if you have a certain wake up scent that you spray in the room 10 minutes before you want to wake the kid up, the brain starts associating bright light, wake up scent, alertness time. It says, Oh, you want me to secrete all these, you know, chemicals. You want me to secrete some dopamine. You want me to secrete a little bit of adrenaline just to like get the morning started. Great. I will do that for you. Almost like think of like, like, like as though there's a little short order cook in the back of the brain and we want to send him the right, order. So if we're watching a scary movie at like nine o'clock at night, we're basically sending that short order cook a nice order for some adrenaline and some dopamine and like, you know, and alertness chemicals. And, and, and like if, if what you want is serotonin and oxytocin and all the calming chemicals, then don't order adrenaline and dopamine. Right. So, right. So in the morning we want to order up those things. So having like a wake up scent, I like to use a citrus scent because there's some research that it increases alertness. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll, we'll spray a scent. We'll have the, you know, we'll have the lights get gradually brighter. We'll make it be a noisy musical. Like, let's get up. Let's, you know, it's like a happy, fun environment. It's time to get up. If I can, I like to do, I like to have kids do, um, 20 minutes of cardio exercise in the morning to really wake their brain up to, again, to send this, the circadian rhythm. I'm just going to close the door one second. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> so I like to, again, we're sending the circadian rhythm, the message that if I'm super alert, my heart's pumping at, you know, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, that means that 10 hours later, it's time to start like lowering 
right and calming me down so we have to send we have to give that almost not the short order cook but almost like the chef that message of like send me the calming chemicals 10 hours later so if i can get kids dancing doing exercise getting their heart rate up doing some jumping jacks anything to increase alertness in the sunlight if i can or like i said in a brightly lit room if i can sends that alertness message so that at night it's like okay now it's the now it's the cooling down time i agree with you about the screens and about you know about having kids um about not having kids you know, on their phones or watching things or anything too close to bedtime because of the blue light, but also because it's stimulating, it's engaging, it makes your brain pay attention. And we're trying to send the message to our brain like thinking time is over, analyzing time is over, now is just like calming, soothing, being present, being calm sure. time. It's not thinking time anymore. Yeah. So sometimes it's true, kids can get hypnotized by something they're watching, but it also can it also can like wake their brain up in a way that you really don't want them to be right like you don't want that at bedtime i find like my kids at bedtime sometimes they turn into like thirsty philosophers who want to like tell me everything that happened in school and ponder the meaning of life you know <laughs> and it's just right. like you know but yeah. mommy, why are people mean sometimes like it's uh, 9 30 your bed is 7 30 we're like this is a great conversation that we're not going to have right now right, right. Like, you know, we don't want their brain, but what happened? Something sparked their brain thinking that. That's why I like reading, like, instead of reading a new story every night at bedtime, I like reading the same few stories over and over again. Because, again, it's like a soothing thing where we read that story. So it's hypnotic. It feels good. But we're, it's not novel information. Sure. Right? It's just like a soothing story that we've heard before a million times. Right? Yeah. So that we know it. And it's just, it's just, like, enjoyable to hear. But it's not like oh, but wait, why did Goldilocks go into the beer's house if they've never heard that story before? Like, that's not the time to start sparking conversation. That's like a 2 o'clock in the afternoon conversation. Yeah. 9.30 at night conversation. I never would have thought of it that way. That's a great, great idea is to go back to those books that they know so that you're not sparking their interest. Because, yeah, we have the same philosophical conversations or discussing – you know, we're into baseball now in my house, so it's t discussing everything and anything in baseball at nine o'clock at night while we're lying in bed. It's like, yeah, I mean, to shut their brains down, you can, you're going to have to to give them those things. I've definitely made mental notes. Like I've said to my kids, like I am, I'm remembering your question because I want to talk. I have this thing. I, I do schmoozing walks with my kids. That's what we call them, where we go on a walk and we schmooze about their day. That's the huh. exciting, like daily, uh, whatever. Um, and like I always say, okay, we're going to save that for our walk tomorrow. That's a great topic. Let's talk about that tomorrow. I, 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 but, but you have to be trustworthy. So I have to like make a note of it, even if I like send myself a text to remind myself, like, we're going to talk about it. And then sometimes I'll be like, oh, I'm over that already, Ma, forget it. <laughs> like, that's not the conversation, you know, which very often happens. But I need to be trustworthy to, to remember to bring the topic back up again. Otherwise, their brain is going to keep – the idea is also, um, especially when we're dealing with anxious kids who have a lot of fears at bedtime, um, I like to think about that concept of the Zagarnik effect, which if you, if you're, if you know anybody in marketing or advertising, it's th things people talk about. It's that effect where when your brain still has a task to complete, it keeps a loop open in your brain, right? So that's how like a TV show will hook you season to season, right? They'll leave the main character in peril. So it's like, you know, tune in season four and find out whether or not he or she died, right? Of yeah. course, you're going to tune back in because the loop is open. Oh my gosh, she's like hanging off the edge of a cliff. I want to know what's going to happen next, right? Uh -huh. Um, so that's an open loop, right? And that keeps us hooked on things. A closed loop is when we're done, we have all the information we need and like we don't have to you know, think about it anymore so our brain shuts it down. With anxiety, we wanna close loops a lot, but not at bedtime. But so when a kid is thinking about all these things, robbers, kidnappers, ghosts, monsters, you know, coronavirus, right? Whatever it is that, that, that is on their head, during the day, that's a really good time to have that conversation and fully answer their questions. People always think like when a kid is anxious, oh, but if I talk to her about it, she'll be more anxious. No, if you're anxious about robbers, let's talk about how robbers think. Let's talk about some basics of self-defense. Let's talk about, let's talk about, about basic smart safety precautions that everybody needs to know. Let's, you know, visit the police station and, you know, ask some questions, you know, of like the sheriff's officer who's going to give us information. Like you're scared of fires. We're going to go talk to a fire marshal and find out what our family needs to do to be prepared for fires. Then we can close the loop. Then at bedtime, it's like, but remember, you have all this information, right? You know. And when the kid goes down the what if, but remember, you know. You have that information. We had this conversation already. We have a fire ladder in our house. We, you know, we know we have our, we have our emergency procedures in our house. We know what to do because 
the loop is closed already. So now they're not coming up with new questions because if they're coming up with new questions, it's like, but remember, we have our procedures in place. We know what to do. We can close our loop now. Now is the time to tell Mr. Worry, thank you for the information. You're trying to keep me safe. I like to talk to kids to talk to kids about their emotions as other people. So Mr. Worry is doing a very good thing. He wants to keep you alive. Best way he can keep you alive is letting you go to sleep right now. So tomorrow we can investigate that question more thoroughly. Now we're going to sleep, right? But again, if you're not ordering up the chemicals in the morning, the kid's not going to be able to fall asleep at night. If we're watching something scary, even mildly scary in the afternoon, we're not going to be able to fall asleep at night. And sometimes simply saying that to a child, like, I'd love to let you watch that movie, but you know what happens when you do. I just recently had this conversation with a fifth grader. A lot of the kids in her class are watching Stranger Things. Um, I have this rule, if it's written by Stephen King, it is not for children. So I don't even know how fifth graders are watching it. Um, but she's like, but I feel so left out. And I said, yeah, so you have a choice. You can like feel left out and be like, you know what? I choose not to, to watch this. I choose to you know, fill my head with more positive thoughts, right? And be confident about that. Or you can watch it and then not sleep at night. Like those are basically your choices. Now you have to pick. Right, because I, I like giving kids autonomy to a certain extent. Like if you're gonna pick sort of being bullied by your peers into watching this movie that's way too scary for you, watching this TV show that's way too scary for you, you know that you know that's the choice you're making. But yeah, then you're not gonna be able to sleep, then you're not gonna control your anxieties. There's gonna be a cascade of effects about that. You're not gonna get you if you have the kind of brain that is like awake worrying about stranger things, you're never gonna get used to it. You're just not the kind of person who can watch horror movies, which is great. I mean that there's nothing wrong with you. You're just not the type of person who can do that. Know your own brain, know your profile, know what you're like, because if that's what you're like, then don't watch the horror movies, right? Like that's just not a smart thing to do. What you're highlighting is the power the power of routine, the comfort piece of kind of knowing, dismantling the worry before the worry. Right. But I know this thing that happens um, with parents is something works. And so it'd be, it would be, uh, tomorrow I am ready. I'm like Piscean about this. Here we go. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to okay. get ready for tomorrow evening. I'm going to start to okay. instill everything you say. And it's going to go great because like you said, it, it's, a, it's, it's exactly what you need to do. I called the doctor and here you are. <laughs> right. Right. So then it'll, I'll do it again to the next day, and then Friday night will come around, and it won't be quite the same. And then no. suddenly that whole routine will just kind of falter. And you know, and and ultimately that's on me as the parent. So it's you know, so there's it's the, nature, there's by the way. Go ahead, sorry. Right, it's human nature that a slip becomes a slide, right? It's very normal. And I think that has to be built into the system that let's say the weekend is gonna be a little bit more, you know, fluid or whatever. So it's built into the system that we go to bed later on the weekend, we wake up later during in the morning on the weekend, because I think it's unrealistic. I know there's like there's a lot of sleep research that suggests that you should like keep to your team even on the weekend. I don't think that's always realistic in, in modern life, you know. Kids have performances, there are family parties, there are things that happen, right? Where like, why should the kid not have that experience? Like it, 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 it's maybe for that very, very or super organized type A personality, you know, who has that same type of child, maybe that will work. But for most kids, it's just not fair. So it makes more sense to say, hey, the weekend's gonna be like this, but come, but come Sunday night, where going right back into our pattern, like, so, so to speak, like, okay, so Sunday night, like, even if you put it into your phone, like, okay, Sunday night, we organize the routine again, like, let's, you know, let's, uh, you know, recommit again, right? We have our weekend routine, we have our week routine, totally fine to do that, right? Um, and then, and then it's, it's built into the system that it's going to be like that, right? So the parent doesn't feel like, oh, every weekend I mess it up, oh my gosh, what's going to be... We are fairly resilient creatures, right? Like our brains can learn. Five days it's like this, and two days it's like that. That's that. It's fine. Again, it goes back to parental self doubt. You didn't mess anything up. It just for a moment didn't work out, and that's okay. You know, holidays happen. You know, there's a family wedding. You know, a baby's born. I mean, things happen in life, and we have to be able to like sort of roll with the punches and then remember that okay, now we're now we're going back to we're recommitting again. Right. And there's nothing wrong with recommitting again every Monday morning. It's okay to slip, but not to slide. Right. Exactly. And we could take, we could take, we take breaks when we give them a little bit of a break themselves, so to speak. Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, my kids have picked up on that. I almost feel like, you know, they realize, Hey, Fridays and Saturdays are like kind of off that during the week schedule. But again, like you said, it's, it's important to drive home. Yes. 
those two days, but not the rest of the five. Um, now that we, you know, you've stayed up and watched uh, shows till eleven o'clock at night, you know, on a Friday night. But that's, you know, let's get back to it, you know, Sunday night for Monday morning. Right. And knowing that, that Sunday night, yeah, parties over, all good things must come to an end. Summer vacation comes to an end. Weekends come to an end. It is what it is. We recommit. And then, and also, I think it's a message to send kids, right? That leisure time breaks, treats are much more fun when they're special, when they're breaks, when they're treats. I had this conversation actually with, um, I was doing a parenting class once of moms of kids who had recovered from, from severe illnesses. And a lot of them were saying how, when their kids were very, very sick, they ended up getting a lot of treats, right? A lot of stuff, a lot of exciting things. You know, everyone feels bad for like, you know, the kids on the cancer ward in the hospital. And now that they're reorienting themselves back into life, things aren't exciting. What normally would be a treat for them was just like, you know, they got used to it and it's hard to now have things that are motivating to them or even have them enjoy a treat because it's a treat. Like just get excited about something because they almost got jaded from getting too much, which is a great thing to tell parents. Also, the most, the biggest gift a parent can give her kid, or I mean, because I say this to mothers a lot because mothers seem to have a harder time with this than fathers sometimes is that word no, right? That like, no, we're not going to eat ice cream for breakfast on a Tuesday morning, but ice cream for breakfast on, you know, a Saturday morning is, is, is a great plan because that's like a Saturday treat. But Tuesday morning, you know, sugar is not the smartest breakfast before school. So yeah, we're not having ice cream for breakfast. But if you're in that kind of house where everyone can eat what they want and like whatever, then nothing's fun. Nothing's a treat. Nothing's exciting. Mm -hmm. Sure. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so how can uh, parents find out more about what you're doing and uh, about your targeted parenting classes and all those good things you have going on? So I'm in a couple of places. I am, um, I have a website, targetedparenting.com, where they can see like clips of classes. And there's a blog with a lot of articles I've written over the year for the print media. Um, and then there is also, I am on Instagram at Dr. Kozlowitz Psychology, where I, it's at, it's, it's at Dr. Kozlowitz Psychology because the other one was taken. Um, and where I basically do a free parenting class every Thursday night at nine Eastern Standard Time, and I talk about a topic of the week and having to do with parenting or anxiety or psychotherapy or any of those things. Like last week, we did um, we did self confidence and how to have self confidence if you're naturally a shy person. I am naturally a shy person, so and I was I was recently at a networking event. I was just explaining sort of how I did it, and then weeks before we did we talked about anxiety, we've talked about moodiness, we've talked about ADHD, and we just talk about like those different topics. I think tonight we're talking about putting your kids in therapy and whether or not that takes away from a sense of personal responsibility. Um, so we're going to have that conversation. And then I also do a psychology today blog. I, I update it weekly. It's also, it's called targeted parenting and where I either highlight an interesting research study and its implications for parenting and like sort of with some takeaways of like, so therefore let's do this, this, and this. I have a whole bunch of them on sleep and on how to help your kids sleep and all sorts of things like that. And then I will also do sometimes like some vignettes from child psychotherapy and implications for parenting. Like just recently I've been writing about coronavirus and how it gives people insight into the, a day in the life of a child with OCD. Like this is what it feels like to have OCD. Now, now you have insight. Now you know, right? Like you're noticing every person sneezing anywhere near you in a meeting, right? This is what your child goes through every single day. Um, so just I want parents to understand child development from what we see in a psychotherapy office or from what I hear teaching a parenting class, like the common questions parents ask and, you know, everything like that so that, you know, the wider public can read about it and, you know, understand it. My, my passion is making psychotherapy and psychology research accessible to parents so that it's actionable and they can be like, oh, I'm going to do this. Like one of my tips about sleep that I actually learned from a research study that really has been working in my house is this idea of taking a really... Um, a, a hot bath, like I said, we pair scents. So I do a hot bath with like a lavender or a chamomile scent um, every night, and then and then a tepid shower because there's something about there, there's something about calming chemicals that are triggered when your brain goes from very warm to cool that puts people to sleep. 
And I find I have a couple of kids who are like by nature very energetic and they're always on the go and they have tons of energy and at night that's even worse. And this really works for them. It really puts them to sleep. Like the hot bath, the cool shower, not cold, we're not torturing people, but like a cool tepid shower. It just relaxes. You can even see the change in their body where I have one kid, he's just a bundle of energy and he's like, oh, I'm calm. And like you see, he's just like already ready to like relax and like lay down and like drift off to sleep. I saw at the toy fair a really nice um, toy. It's not out yet, but it's a therapy dog, and it has like a lavender scented insert that you can put into the microwave. And it's, it was it was made out of a really good like soft plush that felt like very like like therapeutic. And basically, you microwave the insert, and then you put the dog this like therapy puppy on the kid's feet because warming your feet slightly at night helps you fall asleep. And, um, and again, so it's that idea, the calming scent, the warmth, and that like sense of like, oh, I have this puppy in my bed, and he's going to keep me safe all night, you know, it's a it's another calming routine, whether we really believe the puppy's going to keep us safe all night or not. It's another calming routine, because our brains are so easily influenced by patterns. So if we have that same calm routine, I read you these two books. And you know, we take that we take the hot bath, we take the cool shower, the same scent every night, we get into bed, it's like, oh, my brain knows, okay, bedtime now. And it's much easier to hack our brain's patterns than we think. It's really a matter of looking at the data and then hacking whatever we see. Right? Like you wanna, you know, if if, yeah. if you want to philosophize with me nine o'clock at night, let's just shift it to three o'clock in the afternoon. We can have that same conversation six hours earlier. Right? Sure. Like it's just hacking it. But you are Absolute wealth of knowledge. Yes. <laughs> the dark out of my mouth, so. <laughs> I always say I'm a child psychologist and I'm a mom of children. So I have that, I have that like built in focus group in my house <laughs> of a lot of kids. Plus we live in a neighborhood with a lot of families. So, and my house seems to be the happening place to be. So we have a lot of like, there's a lot of children around all the time, but it helps because it's very easy for adults to forget. Just recently I was doing a workshop in a third grade classroom and I was asking the kids about big problems versus little problems. And some of the things that the kids were saying were big problems. I was thinking, you know, I wonder if adults realize like, wow, if you're in third grade, that's a really big problem. You know, like when you're a little kid, that's a huge problem. And like when you're an adult, you're like, oh, big deal. The costume I wanted, you know, I was, I wanted to dress up as this costume and they were out of it in the store and, and I couldn't, and that was the only thing I wanted to be. In. And, and, and then I went home without a costume and now I don't have a, co and I was sitting there thinking like, wow, you know, yeah, when you're in third grade, that's a very big problem. <laughs> you know, like it's not a little problem. We parents think it's a little problem, but like, no, it's a huge problem. My best friend doesn't want to sit with me at lunch. It's a huge problem when you're a third grader. Right, sure. right. Yeah, no, it's, and it's something that it's hard to remind yourself to keep that in mind, you know, when you're dealing with, with your own children. For sure. That, you know, I find that it's like, yeah, you just, what, what seems minimal and small to, to me could, is probably very large in their, their world. So. Right. Well, wow, this is, <laughs> go ahead. Right. And getting into their brain by saying that to them. Right. And like being like, I really get that. Like, Oh, right. I find myself whenever I'm trying to like, sort of get compliance out of my kids and it's not happening. If I reset myself and I say, okay, what's the barrier here? Like, why is this a problem? Like, help me see this through your eyes. Everything just melts, all the problems melt away. Like, so why aren't we moving forward? What's going on here really? They, they'll tell you, like they, they usually know and they usually can explain what's going on. Then we can usually troubleshoot it. You know, it's, it's not our job as parents to control our kids. It's our job to teach our kids how to control themselves. And I feel like we, sometimes when we get into that thing of like, I have to control this kid, get him into bed, get him to school, get him, wait a minute, I need to teach him to get himself to bed. I need to teach him how to get himself to school, right? We, we, we forget that because we're so task oriented because we're the adults and like, we know like, well, this is coming, the, you know, the homework's got to get done, the dinner's got to get eaten, you know, like these things must happen. And we're right because we're adults and we get the implications. Like if we never go to school, that's a problem, right? If every day we miss the bus, that's a problem. But for the kid, it's like, what's going on in your brain that's stopping you from doing what you know you should be doing right now? It's so helpful when we think that way. I, I find like every time I get stuck, going back to but why is so helpful. Wow. Fantastic. All right. That works great. Sounds like we got some more stuff to talk about maybe down the road. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, I'm already thinking of a couple more episodes we can we can schedule with you. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna follow this up with um, some notes about sleep, and I know you have some fantastic articles and blogs, and I know our parents would definitely benefit from those as well. Um, yeah. So, so 
like we always say, definitely going to try and, you know, we'll definitely share everything, you know, you've referenced in the show notes. Um, and then, and then we always get our folks, uh, you know, companion, uh, document to this episode. So that'll be coming as well. And, um, Dr. Robin, thank you very much. This is, uh, this was great. And you, you definitely gave us a lot of, uh, a lot of actionable items and, and things that uh, the parents can work on uh, with their own kids. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast with your hosts, Darren and Brian. Find them on social media at Sound Foundations for Parenting. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And we'll catch you next time on the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast.